when I first uh, started pastoring and I was a youth pastor, um, in all my ignorance, <laughs> I thought that it was pertinent that me as a teacher of the word and a pastor to address current events. I remember coming to church and being frustrated because they were either angry at the culture or pretended like the culture didn't exist. And so what First Baptist Church got me when they got me as a pastor is I refused to shy away to preach on the tough subjects and the things that happen on this planet. I got one baby, amen. God bless you, whoever that was. Um, I'm a people pleaser, and I struggle with it. The enemy has leveraged it to talk me out of making godly decisions. I quite often have, instead of pleasing God, sought to please church people. It's a very difficult time to be a pastor, and it's difficult because people are nominally involved in the church. Bible literacy has decreased tremendously. And the expectation, especially of a rural senior pastor, is unattainable. And in a church this size, as our church continues to grow, more people here calling, which means somehow I'm involved in it. In June of this year, I'm, I'm an honest pastor when it comes to my walk. And it's a very dangerous thing because people will use these arrows against me. Amen. When people get angry at a pastor, they'll use it against me. It comes with the, the slate. And in June, I contemplated quitting. In June of this year, after Rob Dickerhoff died, um, and after that, all the funerals, I'm a single dad. I have a daughter who I don't get to see all the time, and I don't get to go to all her events. And I'm getting these text messages from seasoned believers, people who tell me they're mature believers, that I'm not there for them, and not at one time have they been there for me. They do whatever they want, they say whatever they want, they behave they want. And in June, I, I thought maybe I'm not supposed to be the pastor of this church. Maybe I'm not qualified. Maybe I'm too much. Maybe I'm not mature enough. All these things came into my brain. I was in a room with Robin and Jenny Dive, and I said, y'all, we may have to do something because I don't think I'm the one for this job. And of course, you know, the Lord has spanked you. Has anybody ever been spanked by the Lord? Can I get a hand raise if you've been spanked by the Lord before? I just need to know who's been spanked by the Lord. The Lord spanked me. Um, I'm very concerned about rural community churches. I'm very concerned about our nation. And right now, our nation is embarking on making history. It's like, it's like one thing our government's committed to, we're going to make history. <laughs> Good, bad, or indifferent. And I want, as a body of believers, I, one of the things I'm asking the Lord to do for me is decrease my opinions. I have way too many opinions. I got an opinion on everything. It's just ridiculous. And then, when I finally want to shut up about my opinion, somebody goes, what do you think? I'm like, I'm trying to stop that. <laughs> I have way too many opinions. And so I've been asking the Lord to deliver me from the cussing spirit and to deliver me from my opinions. Deliver me from my opinions. So I do not have an opinion about this, but I think corporately we can spend about 60 seconds praying for our government officials. This is a large church. Everybody doesn't believe the same thing in here, politically. But we all have a chance to bring our politics to the cross and gather around the excellence of Jesus Christ and trust him. I am sorry, and I apologize up front. I don't have a clue what we should do. God bless every single one of you that know what should happen. I don't know what you do, in my opinion, when... I'm just kidding. So we're going to pray. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, I have a ton of opinions, but none of them are right, and I'm going to change them next week. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I want us to take 60 seconds and pray for our government officials, and we're going to go on today's sermon. All right? Let's just take 60 seconds and pray for our government.
Heavenly Father, I pray for wisdom for us as a church. I pray for discernment for all of us believers. And Lord, I pray for no matter how right we think we are on either side of the fence, that there would be a compassion. Help us to out-compassion those who disagree with us. Lord, to those who have a calling to politics, who are tied closely to politics, and I believe it's a calling, I pray that this season of politics would not wear them out. To the people in this room, Lord, whose lives are such a disaster, they have no clue what I'm praying for, they have no clue what I'm talking about. We pray for those people whose lives are dysfunctional, who are in their own chaos. I pray for them right now. Lord, we thank you going ahead that you would pre speak in this house. You'd help me as a speaker honor you and prop up Jesus Christ that you may be glorified. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're moving into a new series here. Over the last several years, um, when Pastor Rick retired, he asked, and I became the senior pastor, um, one of the things that I was passionate about is trying to preach through a book. And we started on 1 John, if you guys remember, and then I immediately figured out why Pastor Rick didn't preach necessarily straight through books, because I felt like we were in 1 John forever. And that's only got like four chapters, and I thought it was never going to end. Then we went to Philippians, then we went to Colossians, then we went to Ephesians, then we went to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was another long one, Philippians another long one. So we're going to go through another book, and by the grace of God, this book only has one chapter. This book is Jude. It's a very strange book in that the writer is drawing from some early texts that we no longer read. And so some of the imagery of Jude can't be found necessarily in the Word of God. It's found on some commentaries that are considered to be outside the Word of God, but can be useful to you in your spiritual walk. Jude is a very powerful book. Jude is concerned with the same things Peter is concerned with, and the word is an A word called apostasy. Apostasy is to abandon your faith. And Peter starts writing about in the last days, many will abandon the one true faith that is found in the word of God. Now Jude is living in the time of this apostasy. And he's looking around going, what is going on? People have lost their minds. Who invites Snoop Dogg and then complains when they get Snoop Dogg? <laughs> y'all didn't invite Bishop Jakes. Who'd y'all invite? I said, well, it was Snoop Dogg. That's where we're at. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? You are blessed. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just keep going. Snoop Dogg's going to be here later on, y'all. Y'all hired a black pastor. Snoop Dogg's going to be right up. No, I'm just kidding. No. Snoop Dogg will not be here. What do we do with the times that we're living in? Man, it is the best of times and the worst of times. At the same, I can go to the doctor via television. I went to the doctor in Garnett. And he was, he was on the television. Check his heart. She put her headphones on and she could hear my heart through the TV. I said, Lord. Oh, that sounds good. I said, what? Now, I know some of you old folks, you got to be right in front of your face and you got to smell that coffee breath. God bless you. I understand. I said, I ain't got to put up no coffee breath. Doctors be breathing on you, you know. I'm like, Lord, get a mint or something. You know, I'm working on this opinion thing, but man, bad breath is bad. It's hot. Smelly. So I said, I ain't got to worry about her coffee breath. She's just checking me and everything to get his blood pressure. Okay, and she could see it. It was cool. But on the other hand, everybody is staring at their phone. Some of you are twitching because you're just like, I, I, I can't, I got to get my phone. I got to get my, I got to get my, I got to get my, I got to get my phone. I got to get, get my phone. My, how long is service going to be? I got to get my phone. I got to get my phone. I mean, it's just terrible. You can't have a conversation. Everybody is like this. Uh huh. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah. So on one hand, it's great. On the other hand, you know, 
Now you can literally just hit a button and then a driver pulls and says, hey, I'm here. Uber. It's awesome. I was skeptical until I did it. This is awesome. Take you wherever you want to go. Get out. That's the thing. He's nice to you, talks to you. You have a friend for like 15 minutes. I'm not kidding you. A best friend driving you around. This is driving Miss Daisy on call. It's great. It's great stuff. But on the other hand, he could just keep driving and drive you to some undisclosed location and you never come back. That's just where we're at. And nobody would know how to find you. I mean, we are in the best of times and the worst of times. And so I think Jude, I, I couldn't do Revelation. We're not ready for yet. But Jude is a great book to get, get us ready for the book of Revelation. Those of you who love Jesus, those of you who are called, this is a great book to ruminate, to meditate on over and over again and see God's direction on what to do with these last days. Two years ago, I preached a message, and I talked about because of the increase of wickedness, the hearts of many will grow cold in the last days. So you know, great, greatness everywhere with cold hearts. So this is how Jude starts his book. He says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. He is Jesus' stepbrother, him and James. To all who have been called by God, God the Father loves you, and you have been kept safe in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write you about the salvation we share, he said, I wanted to write you about salvation. This is a good preaching right here. When your preacher says, I was going to preach on this, but now I'm going to preach on this, you're about to hear a good sermon. I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend, to fight for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people, the kingdom citizenship, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written long ago, we believe he is refer, referring to 1 Peter here, has secretly sleeped in, slipped in among you. They are ungodly people. Listen to what makes them ungodly. And this is going to be tough. Put your seatbelts on. And I'm not preaching on this part, but we're going to read it. But by the grace of God, don't come in a couple Sundays because we're going to land ourselves here. You have to skip that Sunday. <laughs> they are all ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality. I'm not preaching that. Ooh, I want it to. But then I spent a van with my staff, and I said, I can't preach on that yet. I got to get holy before I preach that. <laughs> and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And we know this is true. We know this as the church at large, and we know this in this church specifically. Specifically, First Baptist Church has individuals in here who know the Word of God, they know what the Bible says, and they've taken the grace of God and they use it as license. So I'm going to do it anyway. God will forgive me later. Well, I know this. Hey, hey, I'm just a messenger. Just a minute. That's tough. When you take the grace of God and it's license, I know it's wrong. I know I'm not supposed to be doing it, but God will forgive me. Now, here's the, here's, here's the crux, and we can move on from this where you can be free. He's really coming against preachers who preach that more than lay people who live that. Say amen. amen. I want to be fair to the text, okay? I want to be fair. He's really after guys like me who are people pleasers, want to make you smile, make you feel good, and say, it's okay. Just keep on doing it. Jesus loves you. He loves you. Oh, boo-boo. You just keep on doing what you're doing. That's what he, he's talking to me, not y'all. So that's why I had to let that sermon go. <laughs> he was talking to me. I'm going to preach to y'all, not to myself this morning. No, I'm just kidding. So what, what, where do I want us to land ourselves this morning? Well, it's I want us to look at mercy and peace and love. That's great stuff. I want us to look at the license into our morality. That's great stuff. What I want us to focus on is the first verse from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to all who have been called by God. I want to talk about what it means to be called by God. And if you want to ask me what my greatest concern is by this church right now, First Church Chanute, my called people are sitting on the bench. 
I mean, y'all got this down. Y'all got the sports down. Y'all got 4-H down. Y'all got the fair down. Y'all got soccer down. Y'all got all this down. But boy, the church just really exhausts you and wears you out, and you don't know if you can do it. And I want us to caution ourselves. If you're called by God, there is a response he is looking from his people. And my second concern is, when people start getting called from God, can you let them do what God has called them to do? We believe that God has called Roy Roper to visit people while they're in trouble, while they're hurting. Roy Roper will come visit you. Guys, it would be impossible for me to visit every single person that's in the ark. There's no way I can do it. It is impossible. But Roy is coming. And we're getting people who are here and calling. One pastor can't do everybody's calling. Will you accept the person that has been called into ministry? We're at our point of stopping to grow as a church. We can't get any larger. Unless called people step up, and by the grace of God, we the body accept them in their calling. I know I'm teaching better good than y'all saying. I know that's good. I know that's good. Okay? So that's specifically for our church. Let's look at this text a little differently here. Jude, whose name is Judas, and after that last Judas, he went, I'm going to lower that down. I'm going <laughs> to call myself too. All right, I don't want anybody to get confused. That, Judas was a popular name. Judas was a popular name back then. It was very normal for a person to name their son Judas. And here he is. This is Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. And when Jesus was alive, he didn't believe anything Jesus said. I can prove it. Say prove it. John. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. <laughs> That's talking about Jesus. Yeah, yeah, you made my bed, dog. Yeah, I remember slapping you in the face when you, yeah, remember that time? Yeah, he, he, they didn't believe in Jesus. And in John 7, they're trying to get Jesus to do miracles, and Jesus is like, y'all, y'all my family. They didn't believe him. This guy was an atheist. So if you're an atheist in here, you're, you're in good company. Jude did not believe. Agnostic. Mm-mm, ain't no way my little brother is God. Nope. I would have said amen to that. I said, you know what? I'm with you. And so Jude is very concerned about this type of thinking because he relates to this the most. He's concerned about people who do not believe in Jesus or have fallen away from the one true gospel. And he's picking up where Peter leaves off and he's trying to help the church go, this is how you live in these perilous times. Can I teach this text? Amen. I'm not going to talk about you a whole lot. Is that okay? I didn't say what I need to say about you. We're going to talk about the text. Okay. So he's a leader. He has what I call a holy concern, a holy concern. He's not worrying. He has a holy concern about the state of the church. And you see this come out. You see this come out. Even with the worship, when Lance is leading worship, he picks songs sometimes that he has holy concern. And the words will resonate with you because three-fourths of your theology comes from the songs that you sing. So when you get through there, when you sing Taste and See, you may not remember my song, but you'll go find Shane and Shane and download that song. And that song can ruminate through your heart over and over again. So all of us that are up on the stage and that are leading the church come across times where we have a holy concern, where we see something that just burdens us and breaks our heart, and we want to do something about it. We want to say something about it. And when there's a holy concern being brought forth, you got to ask yourself, are they given an opinion? Or are they given a holy concern? Holy concern should be t- treated totally different than somebody's opinion. Holy concern is rooted in the Spirit. Holy concern is rooted in the Word of God. Holy concern is stirred by God. And God quite often starts people that are called with the holy concern. Now he's calling us unto salvation and Jude is um, implying that in this text. That your salvation starts with being called by God. That salvation is provoked by God's choosing of you and calling to you. And beckoning you. Some call it irresistible grace, his sense of him pulling his children unto himself. But as we look underneath that, there's also a calling within our salvation that causes us to do great things on behalf of God. It causes us actually to solve earthly problems. That's kingdom. When you figure out what God's original purpose is and original intentions is, and then you do something about it, it's not God's will. That we just allow negative things to keep festering and we don't say something and do something about it. 
We don't just get to go, well, you know, the poor will always have, sorry, and step over them. That when you have a holy concern, you should partner with Christ and do something about it. And that is our focus today. You have been called by God. Do you sense what God has called you to do? Do you have any holy concerns? Not just your bills, not just your children, not just your work. Holy concerns, things that you see that are from the Spirit that go, that's not good. Holy concerns. Jude had it. And I want to talk about this thing. What does it mean to be called by God? To all who have been called by God. We were in Atlanta. I took some of our staff to Atlanta this week. And when people would ask me where I'm from, I would say Kansas. And they would start talking about the Wizard of Oz. And they would talk to me about it like it was the first time I ever heard it. (laughs) Every time. The only place that's never happened to me before is in Texas. Because they're so obsessed with themselves, they didn't care where I was from. (laughs) But everywhere else, it's like, oh, how's Dorothy? How's Toto? Hey, Kansas. One lady asked me, do you have running water? I wanted to share that with my staff, but I didn't want Nick to freak out. I did not want Nick to freak out. I'm like, man, the lady just asked me about running water. What? I can't believe it. So I didn't want to freak Nick out, so I didn't say that. She said, do y'all have running water? I said, man, it's 2019, for God's sake. I said, man, I'm glad I didn't wear my boots over here. I almost took my boots. I had my boots on when she asked that. That might have been a different story. I get a tombstone spirit in me when I got my boots on, Phil. Doc Holliday in my boots. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about Wizard of Oz. I think about this all the time. And, 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 and she was just like, follow the yellow brick road. That's what they said. She, she, she killed the Wicked Witch of whatever and follow the yellow brick road. And she was like, yeah, yeah, follow the yellow brick He's on down, he's on down. And her and her dog, and they went skipping. Nobody said anything about lions and tigers and bears. She just skipped right into, and I think people get called by God. And, and we just go, oh, you got a calling. Yeah, go for it. Nobody said that you're going to fight church people all the time and then you change churches thinking it's going to be better over here you go you just ran from a fox into a bear you go, <laughs> oh they crazy over there now you got to make a decision do we stay here and just die or do we go back to where we come from and go oops i did it again i'm sorry you know what do we do i was called to something and now every negative thing that can happen is going wrong. And then you feel called by God and you start doing it, then your family goes crazy. So you take a break from what you're called, because the calling's going great, you know, woo, look at this, but your family's going crazy. And you go, let me tend to my family. And then God keeps messing with you, this holy concern, holy concern, holy concern. You go, all right, family, can y'all behave for three and a half minutes so we can do the Lord's work? And then you go back to the Lord, and then as soon as you start doing that, okay, my family's okay, my, my concern is heading in the right direction, and now I don't have any money. Or you can't find any friends to jump in with you. And you feel overwhelmed. And it's just like nobody told me that being called by God, as Jude is saying here, he's called by God, but he's in a very difficult circumstance. And even the people that are supposed to be with him have started believing other things. They stopped believing the gospel. They're not just picking on him for his idea. They're not just picking on him because he's doing ministry. They've literally stopped believing the same thing he believes. So when you're called by God, you need to know some things. You've got to know what you're getting yourself into because the enemy wants to whip you. He wants to fight you. He wants to keep you. And you've got to contend for the faith through your calling. And it's hard. It's difficult. And y'all might as well eat what I eat. Might as well drink what I drink. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. This is what I'm drinking right now. The first thing I want you to know is being called gives us our identity. I want you to notice something about Jude. He called himself a servant. He didn't call himself the brother of Christ. He didn't use Jesus as like, you know, how you, how you, how you name drop. He didn't like, you know, this is my brother. I know I can preach. My brother was Jesus. He said, I am not more special than any of you guys. I'm just as much as a servant to Christ. You know, I've been asking the Lord to reveal to me about holiness. And holiness means to be set apart, but not to be set above. And I've been in so many movements where people were holy, and they thought they were better than others. And they were pompous, and they were pretentious, and they were judgmental, and they condemned. 
because they were set apart and set above. And I think the hardest thing is to be set apart but not set above. So if I'm important, you're important. If I'm special, you're special. I'm not more important and more special. I am the servant of Christ. If Jude is not name dropping, I'm not going to name drop. If anybody could say, I have some apostolic authority here, whether y'all like it or not. He was my brother. I used to drink sweet tea with him. He ain't saying that. He's saying, I am the servant of Christ. And there's a sense of identity now. Put 2 Thessalonians on your note sheet for a reason. As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters. Look at that. Love by the Lord. You're seeing identity there. Brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God. We're always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when he told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a part of who you are. There is a piece of your identity within what God has called you to do. That's why people say, I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. That's why we say, I'm a teacher. If you're a teacher, that's a part of your identity. It's very hard to be an effective teacher and compartmentalize your teaching. It's a, it's a being thing. And Jude is saying, if you are called by God because of the precious gospel, how could you stay called by God and divorce that precious gospel? If you're called by God because of this precious gospel, how could you abandon the gospel that called you to the calling? So it's, it's an identity thing. I identify with the glory of the cross, and from that I get a glorious calling, and my identity is in that calling. That's why we're so sensitive. That's why it hurts. Even if somebody's being nice, it's like, you know, Pastor, I just don't want to do that. It's like, <laughs> right? When somebody, you need volunteers to the fire escape, and when they reject the fire escape, the reason why it hurts is because it's your calling, your calling, and all that's mixed together. And I don't know how you can get delivered from that. It just is what it is. If somebody comes up to me and goes, that's a terrible sermon. Like, man, Pastor, Jude, it's okay, but that's a terrible sermon. I can say, okay, thank you, I'm working on it. <laughs> it just hurts a little bit, you know? When you're a teacher and then at the parent-teacher conference and the mom pulls out a list of seven things that you think you need to work on, and if two of them are really close to what you're working on, you're hurt. You know, if two of them ring true with you, like, you know, that is true, it hurts because it's your calling. It's hard to have a calling and not have the hurt that comes with it. I want you guys to understand, if somebody in here has rejected Mexico or rejected your ministry or rejected the fire escape, rejected Cherry Street or rejected your preaching or rejected your Sunday school, yeah, that should hurt. But you can't sit down. You've been caught. It's who you are. You are going to be miserable. Well, I think you should do worship like this. Okay, there's nine million ways to do worship. Lance can only do worship the way the Lord reveals to him to do worship. God bless you, and we appreciate the feedback. But the reality is, all I can do is what the Lord is showing me, and I thank you for the feedback. And then you get to go, and then you go home like, what did that mean? Was that them or that God? Nobody in this room is absolved of that conversation. Because it's your identity. And some of you are scared to be called because you're scared of the feedback. Some people don't want to be leaders because they're scared of the kickback. And you're going to be, you're already miserable. You might as well serve the Lord. <laughs> Being called gives us our assignment. Sense of purpose. Sense of, Jude is like, man, we have a purpose. The church has an absolute purpose. This is why we give away a box of food after every service. This is why we do Operation Christmas Child. This is why we're doing Mexico. This is why we, one of the best Sundays I believe I've had at this church was the day that we had the Mexico team and the translator. And I know some of you, that's just, you're not in the place of your walk where you can appreciate that. But I thought that was phenomenal. Because we are the church. We should care. If somebody doesn't have water, we care. Somebody doesn't have clothes, we care. If somebody doesn't have food, we care. The problem that we're having is there's all kinds of ways to care. There's all kinds of ways to get involved, and they may not care, and they may not get involved, or you may not even know what they're doing. And those of you who are leading got to be careful of judgment, of passing judgment in your arrogance and your pride. Being called gives us a glorious assignment. Look what, this is a hard sermon. Let's pray. So something's not right. I don't like the spirit on this place. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us. We're human. Some of us are hurt. 
But I pray your spirit would do the heavy lifting, not me. I can't lift these burdens. Help us to dial in on what you're speaking right now in this moment to us. That we may become the body of believers you've called us to believe. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Being called, this assignment thing is so glorious. Being made for a purpose, knowing that God had something in mind when he made you. Even in Chanute, Kansas, God had something in mind when he made you. So why aren't you serving if you're not serving? Or if you are serving, why are you contemplating quitting? Why are you quitting? Why are you sitting down? The reason why I share with you, me contemplating quitting, because I don't want anybody thinking that that's abnormal. This is what's wrong with our mental health, is that nobody talks about it. So we have people in here who have contemplated quitting their own lives, and nobody's going to admit that they've been there before. And it makes you go deeper into the dark. Some of us just admitting that sometimes the oppression is real and the darkness is real. And even with all the Bible, one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, in his journal, struggles with depression, battles with it, fights it constantly. And he could preach the house down. He had a mega church before mega churches. You're not alone, you're not by yourself. When your emotions win and when the darkness wins, you're not the only one. If you don't believe me, just read Lamentations 3. You'll see the great prophet. Want to quit. So now that you know, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough. You're going to have feedback that you don't like. I mean, there are leaders in here nodding their head because they could all come up here and share with you feedback that they received when doing what God has called them to do. And here's the thing, and Mrs. Jones, you can probably test this. If you're a teacher, you're going to get the feedback anyway, right? You might as well do it with the knowledge of I'm serving Christ. You might as well, you're going to get, ne- there's no avoiding negative feedback. There's no avoid, there's no perfect life outside of doing what God has called you to do. And you can't sit here and go, well, and I, now I know what's going to happen here in a second. Everybody's going to bring me 50 ideas that God has called them to do. <laughs> I know what I'm setting myself up to. And I've gotten smarter, Pastor Rick. I used to wonder why Pastor Rick didn't get excited when others would get a calling, because they weren't going to do it. (laughs) Like, yeah, I hear you. God bless you. Well, we'll see. (laughs) All right, well, get started. But at some point in time, you have to bust a move. And as we talk about assignment, as we talk about calling, you don't know till you don't know. So you just start doing something. If you're a person, well, I didn't know what God was doing. Well, do something. Are you nice? Then smile at the door and say hi to people. Can you cook? But throw something in the plate and bring it here so we can give it out. Can you sing? Come sing for Lance. Let him determine if your voice is what he has in mind for a singer. Am I making sense? But until you get engaged into your assignment, you, this, this, is bo- this whole book is boring because it's for people being called by God. Being called also gives us a standard. He told us that... <laughs> They're living outside lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is when you know you shouldn't be doing it, but you're doing it anyway. You have a license to do what you're doing. But when you're called, you have a standard. And even if people, it doesn't bother anybody anymore. And even if people are okay with it, you wrestle with the standard of Christ. You wrestle with the standard of Christ. Ephesians 4, 4, 1, Paul said, I'm in prison because I belong to the Lord. Therefore, I urge you who you have been chosen, been called by God to live up to the life which God has called you to, that we've been called. There is a standard for those who are called. And we're trying to live up to that life. And even though it seems like everybody else is doing it, everybody else is getting away with it. You're going, wait a minute, I've been called. <laughs> I've been called. After they become Christians, they think they can do just as we like without fear of God's punishment. That's the the Living Bible translation. If you're called, you can't just do what you want and go, God's grace will cover it. You got to learn repentance. You got to learn how to challenge yourself to live worthy of your calling. 
Lastly, being called gives us hope. This is where our hope comes from. Ephesians 4, 4 says, There is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. Called people, you got to always strive and get around people who can help you keep a hope-filled outlook. You want to stay in fellowship with Jesus Christ so you can have a hope-filled outlook. Even though things aren't going well in our government, my outlook for the church is hope-filled. And we want to keep that because he is coming back. He is set to return. That should give us some hope. So I put on your note sheet the, the, the little word, the Greek word there called, and those of you who like to study can study that. But if you're a leader in here, you're called, you're doing your ministry, I want to do better in serving those of you who have been called, but you have to come. You have to come get in with me. I can't serve you if you don't come get in with me. I mean, I'm literally Sunday, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday morning, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I'm here. I'm looking for you. I don't know how I can come to all y'all's house. I can come to one place and y'all can come to me, or I can try to attempt to come to all y'all's house. It's not going to work. But we want to do some things where we serve our volunteers, but it's going to take your attendance. It's going to take you showing up so we can minister together to one another. So if you're a called person in here, you're on my map in 2020, and I'm coming for you, and I'm going to literally get on your nerves with your one-word answers and your text messages. I know what that means. My kids told me. I don't know what that means. I don't like you. Y'all some passive-aggressive, wonderful people. To the call, remember that you are loved. You're loved. I hope that means something. I hope that's not cliche. There are, I, I tell this story all the time, and me and Mrs. Paris were talking, and we were just cracking up, and I was telling Mrs. Paris at vacation Bible school, my grandma used to always say, thank God for Jesus. Oh, thank God for Jesus. And I never understood why she'd say it. She said all the time, oh, thank God for Jesus. If somebody, if somebody started getting on her nerves, she'd go, thank God for Jesus. Thank God. And that meant I would kill him, but thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. When she was on her deathbed, she was in pain, and every time she felt pain, and she didn't want to take morphine because she wanted to come down the last moments with her family so she wouldn't take anything in hospital care. She was in this pain because the cancer was just, was just so difficult. And she goes, mm, thank God for Jesus. Mm, thank God for Jesus. So finally I said, Grandma, why do you always say thank God for Jesus? She said, because when I'm in pain, I say thank God for Jesus because it reminds me pain don't last always. I say thank God for Jesus because this body is wasting away. But because of Jesus, I'm getting a new glorious body. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus because my labor is not in vain. Thank God for Jesus. Every struggle, every critical moment, every tear, thank God for Jesus is not wasted. Thank God for Jesus because we're all going to gather around the throne, good voices and bad voices, and sing songs of holiness to the Lord. Thank God for Jesus. I don't deserve that. Thank God for Jesus. Oh, the putting up with it is worth it. Staying in the race is worth it. Contending for the faith is worth it because of Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Every rejection, every trial, thank God for Jesus. Amen. You're loved. To all who have been called by God, Jude says, God the Father loves you. He loves you. He loves me when I'm silly, when I'm being just silly. Can you imagine? Think about that. God is in every conversation with your spouse, men. And when you dismiss your spouse and when you're pretentious, God is going, look at this fool. I love him. But boy, I tell you. I, 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 if I, if, if y'all would let me, I'd have a Sunday where I just talk to the women. I'm not kidding you. If y'all would let me, I'd have a Sunday where I just preach to the women to hang in there. I just need you to hang in there. God is working on your husband. I know he's not what you wanted, but you need to remember Eve didn't have what she wanted. She was discontent too, and everything was perfect. Oh, I didn't get no amen. I'll move on. Yeah, I just, yeah. I'll leave that one alone. You see how quick they bounced on me. To the call, remember that you are kept. He's keeping you. Your calling, your assignment, your purpose is not all up to you. You're partnering with them. 
He's asking you to do things. He wants you to respond, but he's keeping you. He's holding you. You are kept. Jude would say, to all who have been called by God, you have been kept. He will see you through. I'm begging you to pray this week and spend some time thinking about what God is calling you to do that will impact this local group. It's very rare that God calls a group of people or a person to a calling that does not impact the local church. This community is hurting. This community is hurting. This community is hurting. You've been called to this community. What is God asking you to do? If you, all in, if you are in your calling, remember you are loved. Remember you are kept. Let's pray. Or to the person that's on the outside of the faith. We sang a song this morning in our welcome. I said he picked us up, turned us around, placed our feet on solid ground. Just that piece of the gospel this morning. If you need picked up, Jesus will pick you up. If you need solid ground, he is the chief cornerstone. If you need new direction, he is the way. Holy Spirit, let the person that needs to hear that respond to that this morning by giving their life to you. To the rest of us, Lord, if it's, if it's a loss of calling, I pray that you would reveal by the power of your spirit through your word what you've called us to do. Those of us who are exercising our calling, I'm praying by the power of the spirit, you'd help us to remember throughout this next week we are loved and kept by you. We thank you for all your wonderful blessings. Lord, I look around this room and I'm thankful for the blessing of family. I see all these families. And Lord, I pray for those who don't have a family, they'd get into one of these families and get the blessing of what it means to love Jesus together in community. We love you, Lord. Every ought, every burden, every conflict that we're carrying, we release it to the cross now. Let forgiveness run rampant through the seats and the rows in this building. In the name of Jesus, I pray.